Take your Bibles out. How many brought one of these with you or at least one of the glow and dark Bibles, right? Take it and go with me to the first book in the Gospels, the Gospel of Matthew, and find Matthew chapter 8. Matthew chapter 8. Matthew chapter 8. And Adam, I appreciate you, son. You can wrap it up and be seated. I'm getting ready just to preach. Because if he stays over there and goes to tickling that, then I'm going to go to preaching like a black man, and we're never going to get out of here. Uh, see, that's what I'm talking about. I know, I know what he's trying to do to me right now. I've lived with him long enough to know where this ends up. Right? Matthew chapter 8. Today I want to preach on this subject, outsiders. Outsiders. Um. Like many passages of the Bible, I've preached this passage many times. But I've been studying the miracles of Jesus, but I've been doing word studies where I go through every single word in the passage, and I'm, every week I'm getting shocked by the things that I'm seeing. And I want to show you a revelation that is in Matthew chapter 8 that I've never seen before, that gives a whole new meaning to this story that all of us in here are familiar with. Verse number five, let's start reading there. Matthew chapter eight, verse five. Now when Jesus had entered Capernaum, a centurion came to him pleading with him saying, Lord, my servant is lying at home paralyzed, dreadfully tormented. Now if you have something to underline with or highlight with, I want you to underline the word servant there. It is very important to this passage of scripture. Jesus said to him, I will come. And heal him. The centurion answered and said, Lord, I'm not worthy that you should come under my roof, but only speak a word and my servant will be healed. For I am also a man under authority, having soldiers under me. And I say to this one, go, and he goes, and to another, come, and he comes, and to my servant, do this, and he does it. When Jesus heard it, he marveled. And he said to those who followed, Assuredly, I say to you, I have not found, underline that phrase, interesting phrase in the Greek language, I have not found such great faith, not even in Israel. And I say to you that many will come from east and west and sit down, now notice here, sit down with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob in the kingdom of heaven. But the sons of the kingdom, say that out loud, please, the sons of the kingdom will be cast into outer darkness. What does that mean? How can somebody who's a son of the kingdom be cast into outer darkness? This seems very contradictory to me. So I want to back up and read it again, starting at verse number 11. Jesus said, I say unto you that many will come from the east and the west, sit down with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob in the kingdom of heaven. But the sons of the kingdom will be cast into outer darkness. There will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Sounds like they're going to hell, doesn't it? Isn't that what it sounds like? We're going to talk about that today. Then Jesus said to the centurion, Go your way as you believe, so let it be done to you. Now the word go your way there, that phrase means go as one under authority. Go as one under authority. And his servant the Bible says, was healed that self-same hour. Let's talk about this one word topic today, outsiders. The, the text actually begins with an outsider. Notice in verse number five. Now, when Jesus entered Capernaum, a centurion came to him. You do understand that a centurion is a Roman soldier. So there's a couple of questions that beg to be asked here at the onset of this text. Number one, what is a Roman soldier doing in Capernaum? Now, if you were here last week, I showed you a map of Israel, and I showed you that in the northern part of the Sea of Galilee is Capernaum. And Capernaum was where all of the Orthodox Jews live. So it's heavily populated Orthodox Jews, right? Tiberius was Hellenistic, Romans and Jews and Greeks lived in that area. And then on, over in Gadara, it was totally pagan, totally pagan. But Capernaum was a Jewish city. Why is a Roman soldier in Capernaum? Well, there's a couple answers for this. 
Number one, Capernaum was a border city. It bordered uh, that area and Lebanon and Syria. And so it was a crossroads of that specific, specific area. And being a border city, people were coming across in and out of the territory. So the Roman soldiers would have been there to make sure that they knew who was coming in and out of the territory. So that could explain why this Roman soldier is there. Not only is it a border city, but Capernaum is a wealthy city. If you read your Bible, many of the miracles, most of the miracles Jesus did happen in Capernaum. You'll find out that there are wealthy people in Capernaum. There's a huge synagogue there where the Jews worship. This is the man with the withered hand was in that synagogue that stretched forth his hand and got healed. The Bible says, tells us of many wealthy people that lived in that city. So contrary to what other people teach you about the Bible, I can tell you having been to Israel many times and studied the Bible, that Capernaum was not a poor city. Capernaum was extremely wealthy. And that's the reason one of the people that was located in Capernaum was Matthew, the tax collector. Because he would sit there on the border, and as a Jew, he was collecting taxes for the Roman government. That's the reason Matthew was hated so greatly. Because he's a Jew working for the Romans in a Jewish-dominated area. So Capernaum is actually a very wealthy fishing community. This is where the, all the entrepreneurs of the Sea of Galilee pretty much lived, all of their fishing boats there. So it's not an accident that Jesus is constantly getting in and out of a boat when he comes to or he leaves Capernaum. It's a very wealthy city. There's a lot of money there. It's the, it's the crossroads of that part of Israel where all of the populations are coming together, making their way onto Jerusalem and other parts of the city. That's the reason this Roman centurion is there. But what I want you to notice is he's an outsider. It's not his town. He doesn't really belong there. Everybody there hates him. So the story starts with an outsider. Everybody say an outsider. It starts with an outsider. But notice what this Roman centurion does. This is very important. It says, now when Jesus had entered Capernaum, a centurion came to him. And notice now the word pleaded with him. The word pleading there means to beg. It is also one of the words in the New Testament that could be used for pray. Last week, I showed you something unusual. I showed you how the demons and the man of Gadara prayed to Jesus in the name of God. Remember that? This week, notice we have another outsider who doesn't know Jesus and he's praying to Jesus. This is the word. He pleads with him. And, the, and then it's, the Bible says, saying, Lord, the word saying there is an interesting Greek word. It's a Greek word that has a tense that means conti it's continuous tense. In other words, here's what the Roman soldier did. The Roman soldier, the outsider, came to Jesus and said, and said, and said, and said, and said, Lord, 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 Lord. Hey, Lord, Lord. Now the word Lord there is the word kurios, which comes from an Old Testament passage, which, which is the word that the, the Old Testament would use for master. So G, notice we have a Roman centurion who hates Jews, but he's got the right formula. The formula is Lord. He's willing to submit. This is a man of wealth. This is a man of influence. This is a man of authority and power. And yet he's coming to Jesus. You, you would have to know that all the people in Capernaum who's watching this scene are totally shocked by what they're seeing and hearing at the moment. Roman soldier, Lord, Lord, hey, Lord, Lord, hey, Lord, 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 Lord. Finally, Jesus gives him his attention and notice what he said. He said, my servant is lying at home paralyzed. Now, the word paralyzed comes from a word which means to be literally stricken. Where nothing, Something happened with this servant to where he was literally paralyzed. Nothing in his body would work. And the Bible says he's at home, lying at home. The word lying there means to be thrown into. So this condition has thrown this servant into a bed. There's no hope for him. Here's a Roman soldier, a centurion. He's got at least a, a hundred soldiers under him. 
He comes to Jesus, Lord, hey, Lord, 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 Lord. Finally, Jesus turns and he says, Lord, my servant has been thrown into bed. He is totally paralyzed. I need you to come and heal him. Now, what makes this story so unusual is the revelation I'm about to give to you. The word servant there is the Greek word pious. That Greek word does not mean servant. It means little child. Little child. It doesn't mean servant. It means little child. Every Greek scholar will tell you this. It's never translated any differently. But what we have here is we have the King James translators who are struggling with the passage. Here's a Roman soldier. He's an outsider coming to Jesus. And he says to Jesus, hey, Lord, 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 Lord. Lord, finally, Jesus turns. He says, Lord, my servant. Actually, he said, my child. It's a little boy. My little boy, my son is at home. He's paralyzed. He's sick. I need you to come. And the King James translators are struggling with this. So they put the word servant there. Now, do you know why they did that? They did that. Because a Roman soldier, when he entered the army, when he was commissioned to go into the army, he was commanded to serve for 25 years. During that 25 years, he is not allowed to marry or have children. Uh Uh-oh. We got a problem here. He's not allowed to marry or have children. Now, you know why they did that? Because it gave the Roman soldiers, in in the Roman culture, this is where next Sunday is going to come into play. In the Roman culture, legacy is everything. Lineage is everything. So every Roman soldier, when they fought, they would fight like their entire lineage, their prodigy depended on it. It made them vicious fighters. So that after 25 years, they could come home and they could have children, produce offspring, and have a lineage. And so they would tell the Roman soldiers, you're not allowed to have any children or get married for 25 years. You're going to focus on warfare and you're going to fight like your entire heritage depends on it. Made them vicious fighters. But we got a problem here. Because here is an outsider who's in... Capernaum in a Jewish area. And the Bible tells us he comes to Jesus. Hey, Lord, Lord. I mean, this is a weird scene anyway, right? Roman soldier asking Jesus for help. Lord, somebody in authority with power like that, money like that, prestige like that, asking for help. Hey, Lord, 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 Lord. What do you need? My child is at home. Sick. Will you come and heal him? This is my favorite part of the passage right here. Notice verse 7. And Jesus said to him, I will come and heal him. Notice Jesus didn't say, I'm not coming to your house because you're a whoremonger. Notice Jesus didn't say, I'm not giving you a miracle because you're living immoral. Notice Jesus did not say, I'm not coming to your house because you're an outsider. You're not even a Jew. I'm not coming to your house because you're an occupier. You're the kind of people who persecutes our people. I'm not coming to your house. Let your child die. Now, if that would have been me, (laughs) I would have said, hey, Bubba, you got problems. Because this bald-headed cat is not coming to your house. You hadn't wanted anything to do with me up to this point. Why do you need me now? You don't even belong here. You're not of our community. But that's not what Jesus does. That's one of the things I love about Jesus. That when you're in trouble, even though you have totally blown it, messed up, and even though you don't deserve it, Jesus still has decided to come through for you time and time again and give you a miracle even when you didn't earn it. I guess there's only three or four of us who have been in that situation. 
But I can tell you that I have been there where I did not deserve what God gave to me. But the goodness of God was found in my life. He was good to me even though I did not deserve it. I had sinned. I had messed up. I had missed the mark. I had fallen short, whatever you want to call it. But God did not quit on me. God said, I'm still going to come to your house. I'm still going to help you. I love you no matter who you are, what you've done, or what background you're from, I want you to know I'm on your side and I'm going to come to your house. I love that about Jesus. Now that would have made all the Jewish people mad. So notice now we've got an outsider coming to Jesus. All the insiders are ticked. I don't know who he thinks he is. Think he's just going to go up into this Roman centurion hat? Don't he know what he's doing to our family? This is the guy that beats us. This is the guy that if he disagrees with us, he had his soldiers whoop us back to our house. And he's going to go into their house. This is what the insiders are saying. Can I continue? Then the centurion answered and said, Lord. Notice he keeps using this word, Lord. I'm not worthy that you should come under my roof. The centurion knows that he's in trouble. I'm not worthy for you to come under my roof. But watch what he says. He says, but only speak the word and my servant. There it is again, my child, my little boy will be healed. For I'm a man under authority, soldiers under me. I say to this one, go. And he goes, another come and he comes. And, and to my servant, do this. And he does it. This man understands the power of authority. Not only those in the military who have served time in the military can really understand what is being said here. When you have somebody, a, a, a ruling officer over you that higher rank than you can give you a command, you don't question it. Yes, sir. And you go do the command. And this Roman soldier says, hold it, Jesus. Uh, I'm a whoremonger. First of all, I'm an outsider. Second of all, I'm a terrible sinner. I'm in trouble. You don't have to come to my house. Just send the word. I understand how authority works. Now, what amazes me is this outsider had this understanding of the realm of the Spirit. Isn't it amazing how many unchurched people know more about the realm of the Spirit than church people? Isn't it amazing that outsiders value the realm of the Spirit and what goes on in the Spirit realm more than the insiders of the church have a heart to know what's going on in the realm of the Spirit? This is the story. There's so, much, there's so much I could unpack here, but I don't have all day. I'm trying to get somewhere with this. The Bible says in verse 10, look at it. When Jesus heard it, he marveled. The word marveled there is a word which means to be dumbfounded. It means to be shocked. So when this centurion says this, this outsider approaches Jesus like this, Jesus goes, whoo. What the world is going on here? And then he makes this statement. He said, I have not found such great faith, not even in Israel. Now the phrase there, I have not found, means I have investigated and have been looking for. So that the whole time that Jesus started his ministry from Cana and Galilee, he is walking around looking for somebody who has this kind of faith. He's visiting all the insider's house. He's hanging out with all the Jewish people, all of these people who have studied the first five books of the Bible. They are the religious folks. They are the church folks. They should know what's going on. They should know the time that they're living in. They should sense the moment that we're in right now that something prophetic is happening in our midst. Yet they're dumb to it. They're deaf to it. They're blind to it. And here comes an outsider. It says to Jesus, you only had to come to my house. I got faith that if you just speak the word and send it that direction, that my servant will be healed. And Jesus is totally shocked by this. And basically here is this outsider, insider story playing out again. Here's an outsider 
The faith that I've been looking for, I find it right there. I don't find it in here. I want to submit something to you. If we don't have a revival in the body of Christ, if the body of Christ doesn't have a spiritual awakening, what you're going to have is you're going to have all those outsiders out there that we make fun of all the time that we think don't deserve God's favor, God's blessing, God's mercy, God's grace. Those outsiders out there are going to have an inclination, a discerning of the time in which we... Even the world, that, that people that don't go to church right now are looking around saying everything is so jacked up. Something's got to give. Here's something's got to take place. Everybody knows that something is going on, but in the church, we're lukewarm. We're sitting here. We go through the motions. We have no real sense of the prophetic times of the prophetic days in which we live. And it's time for the church to arise out of their slumber. We should be seeing this kind of faith in the body of Christ, not outside the body of Christ. But I want to tell you, I want to tell you, it's just like the parable of the wedding supper where he said, sent them out to the highways and the hedges. He invited his friends to come, but they wouldn't come because they didn't realize what was going on. Jesus was getting ready to throw a party. We were talking about this earlier before service. Listen, our window of outpouring is closing, not like this. It's closing like this. Things are on an accelerated pace and we as the church need to wake up to the season and the times that we are in and express a faith to God that says, God, if you'll just speak a word toward America, everything can change. If you'll just speak a word toward my life, everything can change. I've not found great faith like that. Are y'all with me today? I've not found great faith like that. Jesus is shocked by this. I've been investigating from the time I've been here. I've been investigating. It reminds me of another passage of scripture in the epistles. Or, or in the gospels where Jesus said when he comes, will he find faith on the earth? We've got bigger churches now than we've ever had. And Jesus is saying when he comes back, will he even find faith on the earth? See, I have this sneaky suspicion that Jesus is still investigating. I might turn preach to the screen. I have this sneaky suspicion that Jesus is still investigating, walking to and fro in the earth, looking for somebody that he can show himself mighty on their behalf. He's still looking for faith. All right. I, 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 got, I got to go on here. Uh, verse 11. This is the one we got to deal with here. I say to you that many will come from the east and west and sit down with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob in the kingdom of heaven. Now he's talking about heaven. Watch this. Look at this. The scene shifts from earth to heaven. He said there's going to be people far and wide who are going to be in heaven. In heaven. Amen. That's a good thing, right? But he says something about them. But the sons of the kingdom will be cast into outer darkness where there'll be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Now, do you know why Jesus used this phrase, outer darkness, weeping and gnashing of teeth? Do you know why he used this phrase? Because it was a phrase that was used during the time. All of the cities of the ancient world, mostly, especially in the Middle East, were walled cities. Because you had invaders who were constantly trying to come in and take the cities. So you had these big walled cities. Well, because there's walled cities, whenever you need to get rid of trash or extra food, what did you do? You tossed it over the wall. And so at night, the lions and the hyenas and other wild animals would come and they would eat. The stuff that had been cast over the wall. But something else was cast over the wall. Whenever a person committed a crime, but there was no evidence. In other words, I suspect that this person did this crime, but we did the trial and there's no evidence. What they would do is they would take that individual and they would put him outside the wall at night, outer darkness. Inside the city, it was lit. But outside the wall was dark. They would take this individual, drop him outside the wall. And this individual all night long would hear the footsteps and the growls 
and the movement of wild lions and hyenas and other things that were coming around. And they knew that if they got discovered, they would be eaten at any moment. So fear would grip them. And what they would do is they, they would weep and they would gnash their teeth. And history records that many of them the next day, whenever they went in, had literally broken and gnawed their teeth all the way down from fear. Weeping and gnashing of teeth. Now, if you lived through the night, which was a big if, if you lived through the night, everybody thought you were innocent. Isn't that something? How'd you like that justice system, right? You're, you found innocent on evidence, but because we don't have evidence, we still suspect you, so we're going to see if the lines will eat you. But if you made it through the night, so here's what Jesus is saying. There'll be many people in heaven who will realize that at their prophetic moment, they were actually an outsider and missed what I wanted to do in their life. It's not that they won't make it to heaven. It's not what he's saying. What he's saying is there'll be many sons of the kingdom who are there and will sit down with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob and the other patriarchs and they will realize at that moment all of the mighty miracles that I would have done for their life, but they were not in tune with what I was trying to do on the earth and they were an outsider when they should have been an insider. Wouldn't it be sad For you to get to heaven only to hear the Lord say, I tried to give you a miracle, but you wouldn't make the relationship. I tried to do this for you, but you wouldn't follow the leading of my spirit and go to this place or go to that place. See, I think when we get to heaven, a lot of us have questions. I'm going to ask God, why he didn't heal this? And why he didn't do that? And why he did this? And why why didn't God come through on that? I think when we get to heaven, God's going to say, hold it. I just want to show you something. Let me play a little movie for you. Here's where the Holy Spirit, here's where the angels were moving in your life to try to get you orchestrated so that I could do a mighty work for you, but you would not follow the leadership of the Holy Spirit. You wouldn't yield to what I wanted to do. You wouldn't study the Word. You wouldn't pray. You wouldn't seek my face. And you missed out on the greatest, most miraculous moment you could have ever had. And in heaven, I wonder if we'll sit there and weep and gnash our teeth. You say, well, hold it. There's no crying in heaven. Mm. 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 There's a scripture over in Revelation. It's a long time from now. At the end of the millennial reign, whenever that is, after the tribulation period, at the end of the thousand year reign, at the end of that time, the Bible says, the Lord shall wipe away every tear from their eyes. See, we we, we hear things quoted all the time, but we don't put them in good context. So I wonder if some of us are going to have some weeping to do because we missed our moment with God. You know what we're real quick to do? Well, those old Jews, they shouldn't have crucified Jesus. Them Jews, they they not and they didn't know what they was going on. What they here's what I see. I see a bunch of church people in our age who don't understand what God's doing and why God's doing it. We don't know how to respond to the time in which we're living in. And yet I see people on the outside. I'm gonna get myself in trouble. Every week I try to thin the crowd. (laughs) Get myself in trouble. We should have prophets in the church right now who are telling us where to fall on every issue of our time. But they're not in the church. Do you know who God's having to raise up who has an understanding of the time? Ben Shapiro. People that aren't the most moral, necessarily godly people on the planet. 
Who's some other ones? Huh? Can I tell you somebody that blows my mind? Uh, now, don't, don't, don't go read his tweets because it's got cussing in it. Tim Pool. Tim Pool is a young man who was extremely liberal that has forsaken the... He sees what's going on and he says, you know what? This is crazy. All this stuff is crazy. It's not logical. And he's blowing a horn, sounding an alarm to America that something needs to change. He don't even know Jesus. And we in the church say, well, you know, they need, just need to get saved. Well, it could, it could be that maybe they're more inside than we are. Maybe they know something that we don't know. Maybe they sense something that we don't sense, like Stephen Crowder. You say, are you espousing all these people? No, I'm not espousing anybody. I'm just simply saying, I wonder sometimes, where are some of those prophetic voices in the body of Christ who are heralding the truth without compromise, saying, thus saying the Lord, they don't care who it makes mad. They don't care who they offend. They, it's not about the money to them. They just want the truth. They need to stand for the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, so help me, God. And we don't have that going on in the church. So you know what God does? God allows Roman centurions to arise who have a sharp sword in their mouth speaking truth to the day. I don't want to get to heaven and God say, man, I really wanted to do a miracle in Cookville. I really wanted to shake the upper cumberland. But you didn't do this and missed it. Or your church family didn't do this and you missed it. I don't want to stand there and weep and gnash my teeth because I missed it. I get to heaven, no regrets. Come on, somebody, say no regrets. When I get to heaven, I don't want I want to live with zero regrets. When I get to heaven, I want to say to God, God, I left it all on the field. I left right, wrong, indifferent. I did the best I could with the knowledge I had. I left it all on the field. I didn't pull any punches. I didn't play any games. I left it all on the field. Anybody else in this room want that? All right. Let me finish. But the sons of the kingdom, verse 12, will be cast out into outer darkness and there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Now, what I want you to do, here's your homework. Go find all of those phrases in your New Testament and go with the understanding that I just gave you and see what it does to the Scripture for you. Then Jesus said to the centurion, go your way. I know you're an outsider and as you believe, so let it be done for you. And his servant, his little child, there it is again, his little child was healed the same hour. couple things in here. Number one, if you're not right with Jesus or you don't know Jesus, never you, you maybe never maybe a, a real commitment to Christ. Let me tell you something. Just like this centurion, Jesus loves you. And one of these days you'll look back even though you didn't serve the Lord and you'll have to recognize all the play. Even some of you right now should have been dead a long time ago. But Jesus, I said, but Jesus came through for you. But Jesus, right? If you don't know Jesus today, let me tell you what the kingdom needs right now. The kingdom needs some people like you who have been on the outside to come over and become an insider and say, you know what? I've got faith in this Jesus. The kingdom needs you. The kingdom needs you. It needs you. You're important to what God wants to do on the earth. There's not a person in this room that's here by accident. You're here by divine purpose with divine purpose. And there's a difference. God created you with a purpose and for a purpose. Everybody in the center of this. God needs you for the kingdom. 
And let me tell you something. Giving your life to Jesus is the greatest decision you'll ever make. Amen. Now, I'm not going to say to you that it doesn't mean you have to give up anything or that it doesn't mean you have to give up anything because the truth is it could cost you a lot. It could cost you everything. But what you gain in Jesus on the heaven side of things is so far superior than what you've lost on the natural world side of things. So if you don't know Jesus in here today, you don't got to go through a religious calisthenic. You don't have to put your name on the membership of a church role, even though if you get really born again, you'll want to be a part of a church. All you got to do is simply, look at me, is simply do this. All you got to do is simply from your heart, mean it from in here, Jesus, just like this centurion did, Lord, Lord, surrender yourself. Say, Jesus, you are Lord. I give my life to you. I need you to become the Lord of my life. You're going to be in charge. I don't care how much authority, how much influence I got. You're going to be in charge. I'm not going to be in charge anymore. I'm going to surrender my life to you. The moment you do that and you mean it, the Bible says in heaven an angel takes out a book and writes your name in the Lamb's book of life. It also says on the earth, the old things in you pass away and all things become new. You get a brand new life in, in like a twinkling of an eye. Bam, you're brand new. Not only that, you get this big, beautiful, wonderful family. Red, yellow, black, and white. We all messed up in his sight just like you. Right? You get a big, beautiful family called the body of Christ that's not just here in Cooble, but around the world. There's so many benefits to serving Jesus. So first of all, if you don't know Jesus today, my heart is that you would make Jesus Lord. In just a moment, I'm going to open this altar up and I'm going to pray for people today to receive miracles. But the greatest miracle that could ever take place is for your soul to be saved. It's still the greatest miracle. It's a supernatural. Secondly, the people I want to talk to in here today is maybe you're in here today and you say, Pastor, I need God to do a miracle right now. It might even be your child. I don't know what it is, but you say, I need God to do a miracle right now. Maybe it's healing of your body. Maybe it's God to step into your family, whatever it is. I need a miracle right now. And like this centurion, I'm willing to say, Lord, 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 give me your attention. Give me your attention. This is the reason I felt like I wanted to pull us in one service. I know it's super tight in here. But I told the crowd, the group earlier, the praise and worship, I said, I'm so glad that I don't have a time restriction today because now I can stay all morning and lay hands on people and pray. If you need a miracle, I don't care what it's for. If you have faith that he's a miracle worker, a way maker, that he'll do it for you today. I, listen, don't come if you don't believe. But if you believe, he will do it for you today. If you'll be like this soldier, you might even say, my kid ain't even here. But Lord, if you'll send the word today, he'll be healed. If you need a miracle, I'm going to ask everybody in just a moment to stand up. And listen, when we stand up, if you need a miracle, I need you to step into this middle aisle right here. Something prophetic is getting ready to happen in our church, and I'm going to tell you how I know that. Pam and I had a prophet years ago that shook our life. The problem is he won't come to your church when you call him. He'll call you and say, the Holy Ghost has been talking to me. I need to come. And it might be 10 years in between times that he does that. Was it Friday? Friday he calls me out of the blue and says, I've got God's talking to me about you and about this thing you're doing. And cook. He said, there's getting ready to be an enormous move of God. And he said, God's talking to me. I said, when do you want to come, prophet? Now, I'm just going to warn you. When he comes, most 
people, or a lot of people in this church won't even show up to church. Do you know why? Because he's the real deal. So after about 10 minutes of him moving in the gifts of the Spirit, everybody gets scared that he's going to call out their sin. So they run from him. But isn't that what prophets do? Prophets come in and this the presence just is here's the trouble of Israel. Here he comes, right? He said, I'm going to call you the first next week. Let me see when God says to come. Something's getting ready to happen. And I believe God's opening the heavens over us. And the reason I pulled us together in one service is because, I'll just be honest with you, I'm not interested in just building a big church. If that happens, great. I'm interested in saying, God, let the Holy Ghost move in us. I don't care how many people it is. Let the Holy Ghost move in us. If you're in here and you need a miracle, I'm telling you, I've seen him do it, but I've not only seen him do it, but I feel like I have a word from heaven today that he said, if I put my hands on you, he will do it. He will do it. So I'm going to have everybody stand in this room. I tell tell you what we're going to do, because I feel like this is going to get ready to be overwhelming. Worship team, you guys get in your place. I want my prayer team to come right now and and make a line on either side here. Y'all remember the old fire tunnels? We're getting ready to have a fire tunnel. Come on, prayer team, come. Come on. Prayer team, come. Either side, right here. One person there, one person here. Person there, one person here. Face each other. Make me a tunnel right here. Make me a tunnel. I'm going to have to speak in tongues for them to interpret this. Right? All right. Look at it. People already lining up. Now, ushers. In fact, if you want to go ahead and just move, just go ahead and move up here. I'm going to need you right here. Do not block this area. Do not block this area. I want everybody who needs a touch to be able to get to me. Don't. I don't need any protection. I need the Holy Ghost to allow me to minister to people. Now, those of you who are coming for a miracle, when you come, after I pray for you, go this way, go that way. Because after I pray for you, as you're walking this way, they're going to lay hands on you as well. And they're going to believe God to give you what you're asking for today. I believe something supernatural and special is about to happen in this room. Now, worship team, go into a song. I want us to worship God. I'm going to turn this microphone off. Are y'all ready? Does anybody have anointing oil? Anointing oil. Give me some anointing oil right here. Yes. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. That's good. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Hold your hands up. Hold your hands up. Father, in Jesus' name. 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 Now, Lord, 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 we're crying out to you. We know if you'll just speak the word that supernatural things will happen. God, I have no ability to perform a miracle, but you can speak the word from heaven's throne room and supernatural things will happen in this room as we pray today. Let it happen in Jesus' name on earth as it is in heaven. Those of you who have lined up in the middle, go ahead and start walking this way. Father, in Jesus' name, I put my hands on them. I thank you for the miracle that you're about to do. I thank you for the miracle that you're about to do in their life. In Jesus' name. 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 name. 
Thank you for the miracle that's about to happen. In Jesus' name. 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 In Jesus' name, in Jesus' name, thank you, Lord, for doing the miracle. In Jesus' name, in Jesus' name, thank you, Lord, for doing the miracle. In Jesus' mighty name, in Jesus' mighty name, in Jesus' name, in Jesus' name. Jesus name. Jesus name. In Jesus' name. Neely girl at. 
Come here, come here, babe. Step right here. Lift both your hands. There is a more dangerous death than anything in life that you'll face, but this one is called death by distraction. The Lord is saying, don't be distracted. Do not be distracted. Come out in Jesus' name. Do not be distracted. Not in this season of your life. God said, tell her, I did not create her heart to be walked on. I did not create her heart to be walked on. There's a call on your life. Don't allow the enemy to distract you. Because I can promise you the pain of some decisions you're going to have to make is going to far outweigh the pain if you keep going in the distraction. The Lord says, I've got a great plan for your life. No distraction in Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. name. Now, can can you guys just worship for a moment? Let me just, I just want to walk around, see what the Lord wants me to do. Just keep worshiping for a moment. Come on, every hand lifted. Get your eyes off me. Jesus. Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Great is your faithfulness. Great is your faithfulness. Thank you, Lord. 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 Still stands. Great is your faithfulness. Faithfulness. I still in your hands. This is my confidence. Is is there somebody in the cafe? Are there people in the cafe? I need everybody in the cafe, please come in here because I feel like I got a word for somebody, but they're not in the room, but I feel them on the property. Don't don't be scared. I'm not going to do anything God doesn't want me to do. All right. Lady in the white dress right there. Come up here real quick to me. There's a man with a white shirt on. I don't know if he's come in the room yet. Stand right there. Hallelujah. What's your name, baby girl? Kristen. When you came through a while ago and I put my hands on you, I felt the Lord say, Have her come back. I'm going to deliver her. There's a man in here with a white shirt. White shirt. I'll find you just. No, it's not Sam. Sam, where you at? Come up here real quickly. See, we can do church as usual or we can walk out of here and things supernaturally happen, right? How long had the enemy battled you in addiction? A year, a little over, oh Lord, it's been a long time too. How long you been fighting? Four years? Got any babies? Yeah. You want it all restored, don't you? Huh? I want it all. (laughs) 
Pam. Kristen. I know this bothers you. Right? Look at me. She's going to take you somewhere, and we're going to find out what it's going to cost. And my wife and I are going to help pay for it. My intent is to remove anything that when you look in a mirror, you ever see that old person again. Because after I get my hands on you today, you're not going to be the same person that's going to walk out of here. This in Jesus' name. Now you draw a line in the sand today and you let the devil know he can't have your babies. He can't have your life. And God is going to restore everything that's been taken from you. I feel the Holy Ghost on me. Alright? Take your right hand. Put it right there on her head. I want everybody to stretch forth your right hand right here now. If you're, if you're filled with the Holy Ghost and you speak in tongues, pray in tongues. If you're not, don't get freaked out about it. Just pray in English. In the name of Jesus. From the crown of her head to the sole of her feet, deliver her. Deliver her. Deliver her. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Now I need some Holy Ghost filled women. Come get on your knees. Put your hands on her and pray in the Holy Ghost over her. She's not leaving here the same way she came. She's not leaving here the same way that she came. If you're battling addiction, get yourself up here to this altar real quick. Come on. I don't care if it's just cigarettes and you want to be free from it. Get yourself to the altar right now in Jesus' name. Ushers, help them get up here. All addiction's got to go in Jesus' name. All addiction has to go in Jesus' name. All addiction has to go in Jesus' name. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Shh. Hallelujah. 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 name baby huh Tinley what's your name mama Tammy what's your name bud huh Elijah what a name what a name thank you Jesus you to stand right here. I want you to put your right hand on his chest. I need two spirit filled. You, you can be one. Come up here. You be one. I want you to put your right hand. You put, pray with them too, Liz. In Jesus' name. Right here. This this is right here. Right there. In Jesus' name. If you're filled with the Holy Ghost, come on. I want you right now in the name of Jesus. Come on, church. The Bible says the effectual fervent prayer of righteous men and women availeth much. In the name of Jesus, the name that is above every name, 
I rebuke every tormenting spirit, every spirit that binds in the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. Every mocking spirit in the name of Jesus. I command it to loose this young man so that he can be free to serve the living God. Father, send angels now to torment every tormenting spirit. In the name of Jesus, I break the power of addiction off their life. In the name of Jesus, I break the power of addiction. In the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. I break the power of addiction off their life in Jesus' name. In the name of Jesus. The promise still stands. Great is your faithfulness. Your faithfulness. I'm still in your hands. This is my confidence. You've never failed me yet. You never failed me yet. never failed me yet There's a young man in here, and I can see you. In, I, I don't know if I prayed for you or what, but I can see you in, like in, a, in my spirit. You have a white shirt on. You have tattoos. But 10 years ago this month, 10 years ago this month, Satan tried to take your life. 10 years ago, this month, Satan tried to take your life. And you've been struggling from that time till this time. And I feel like I'm supposed to pray with you. And I can't, I can't see because of the audience. And I'm not going to waste a lot of time here and wait a long time. But if the enemy tried to destroy your life 10 years ago this month... We're going to sing this one more time. Come. Hey, hang on just a second. What is it? 2012, my birthday, June 14th, was my first overdose. You're free now. I need everybody, if there's somebody else, and these, this is for men, if there's another man in here, June 14th means something to you, I need you to get out of your seat, come up here. Folks, this is just how the Holy Ghost works in me. June 14th, if it means something, get out of your seat. And come up here real quick. I've watched God do this over and over again where two and three people would be affected by the same day. Come on, don't miss your miracle because you're scared. If drag queens don't scare you, the church shouldn't scare you. Right? Lift both your hands. Somebody's going to miss out on a miracle here. 
Where's your wife at? Come here, baby. Right here. People have said this before, but this really goes for you. The devil should have killed you when he had the chance. He tried and failed and he missed his moment. The Lord says, by this time next year, this same month, the month that the enemy tried to take you out. The Lord says, by this time, next year, the same month, there will be divine doors open for you and you will look up and say, how did I get here? There is a 10-year recompense that's coming to your life. The Lord says, I'm going to make the enemy pay you. Not by restoring what he's taken from you. But he said, I'm going to make him pay you for 10 years of suffering. And God said, I'm going to bless you. And it will be more than you can receive. There's a gift on your life. Not only for ministry. But there's an entrepreneur in you. And God is going to open the coffers of heaven. And resources are about to come into your life. By this time, next year, the same month. The two of you will stand and say, how did they even hear about us? I hear the Lord saying this to me. How did they even hear about us? How did they know about us? For the Lord said, I am sending forth angels. And these angels are going to whisper your names in the ears of people in high places. And that will be how they have heard about you. And the anointing for preaching is on you. The anointing for preaching is on you. Quit doubting it. People are underestimating you. Dynamite comes in small packages, says the Lord. The Lord says, this is my dynamite. You know, the scripture says, who finds a wife, finds a good thing, obtains favor of the Lord. You got double favor on this one. I feel fire in my hand on her head. Lord, she wants to be used as a mouthpiece for you. Now God opened doors for her to preach the gospel to the ends of the earth. Take the two of them far and wide. For you will not preach like others. Because I have not called you to be a teacher even though you can do that, says the Lord. I've called you to be a fireball. I've called you to be a terror in high heels. Oh, yeah. Uh, come here, Miss Vicki. You ever heard of Darlene Bishop? Huh? You need to get online. YouTube, Solid Rock Church, and watch Darlene Bishop. You could be another Darlene Bishop. I felt that when I put my hands on her. So I want you to put her hand right there on her womb. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Are y'all believing for something? Elijah, are y'all believing for something? Are you believing for a child? No. She said, oh God. No, no, I'm not prophesying that. Because I'm telling you right now, whatever you're believing for is getting ready to happen fast. Like it's going to be a quick work. It'll be a quick work. 
It'll be so fast it's going to take you by surprise. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. And this is my confidence. never failed me yet come on lift your hands and sing it he's never failed me yet he's not gonna start now he's never failed me yet still stand Lord, we love you today. We, we submit everything we have to you. Sir, you're the only thing that means anything to us. We humble ourselves under your mighty hand. We're here to do whatever you called us to do, whatever you anoint us to do. Not our will, but yours be done. And Master, I want to thank you for moving today, for speaking today, for shaking us today, for changing us today. When we walk out of here, let us walk out of here having said it has been good to be in the presence of our God. We celebrate you and we celebrate the kingdom and we declare of your kingdom there will be no end. We know what the world says and we know what agendas are trying to do, but we declare of your kingdom there will be no end. Jesus be exalted in our time. We give you glory. Amen and amen. Well, I feel like it's been good to be in God's house this morning. Amen. All right, Wednesday night, 6.30, come ready to study the Word of God. If the Holy Ghost takes over, we'll do more of this. But, uh, so just come prepared for whatever, amen? Well, get out of here and go have a great day in Jesus. Go eat some good food for me, amen? Eat like you're eating for me and you. I love you. Have a great day. We'll see you Wednesday night.